Okay, so this next presenter is a good friend of mine, and I'm, I'm, I'm extraordinarily excited to hear her talk about this subject. So she's going to talk about parasites. And I always find this subject to be so interesting because when I first got started doing this, if, if something died, it was either because of a bullet or a parasite. That was, that was the answer to everything. It was a parasite killed it, a parasite killed it. Oh, it was parasites. And that was the answer to every death that, that I had as it related to any of the animals that I, that I was breeding. And the answer that I was given was just put some wormer in the feed. You know, if you do it quarterly, that's going to solve your problems. And that didn't solve my problems. And so one of the things I, I greatly appreciate about the speakers that have been up here today is... Um, they're really providing concrete data and information that, that gets rid of some of these old wives' tales that have been told about how to best go about doing these things. Or as, what did Daryl's guy at the coffee shop, Billy Bob or Bobby Joe, or uh, there's all these things that go around about what to do, but they're not generally backed by much science. And I know Brittany is extraordinarily smart. Um, she backs what she says by science, and not only is she really great at talking about parasites, but she is an excellent resource as it relates to being a vet as well. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Brittany East. All right, I know you guys have been sitting for a long time, so I put a lot of pictures in this and videos to try to keep your interest. Um, so I'm here today to talk about integrative GI parasite management. Um, I'm a wildlife veterinarian, and my husband and I own an exotic consulting company. His name is Ian. He's in the back, um, and he'll be available uh, afterwards for questions as well. Um, so we talk about integrative GI parasite management. You guys have expensive assets, so we want to do our best to protect them. And the most common phone call that I get from producers um, is what Brian said, I have animals dying, it must be parasites. Um, and oftentimes it's actually not, um, but sometimes it is. So we're going to talk a lot about um, what that looks like. These are all the places that we're going to go today in this PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's just kind of a roadmap. We're going to talk about foundation, which was just covered in the last lecture. Um, resistance, getting to know the enemy, what types of parasites there are out there, the clinical signs that we see in exotic animals, how do we identify them, um, how to kill the enemy, non-chemical dewormers, and management strategies. As you can see, I told Brian this is no way going to be a 30-minute presentation, so they kindly um, gave me an hour to give it, and thank you guys for handling my very long PowerPoint, getting it sent over today. So. This is going to be a controversial slide. Um, this is something that we talk about with domestic producers a lot. The goal is not to create a parasite-free animal. The goal is to prevent clinical disease and economic losses. This is a really hard concept for people because we want our number to be zero. We want our animals to have zero eggs per gram, zero parasites. It is unrealistic. Um, we can't expect that our animals are going to be zero. That's not the goal. Um, you're going to create a lot of problems by uh, putting that as your goal as zero. Our goal is to prevent disease and to lose animals from economic losses. There is a healthy degree of parasite burden. That sounds like an oxymoron, but it's true. Um, our animals can carry a parasite burden that still allows them to produce um, offspring, they have good body condition, and they're not sick. So this is our preventing clinical disease and economic losses. These animals can carry a parasite burden. That is fact. Um, they're not going to be zero, so zero is not a number to strive for. There are things that are within our control and things outside of our control as it comes to foundation. Um, outside of our control, Mother Nature, as we all experienced in February, um, we can't control the weather, um, but we can control what we put into our animals to prepare them for the worst, um, for winter storms, for parasites, for disease. Um, we can control the age of our population in terms of what we bring in. Obviously, we can't control aging. Otherwise, if, any, if anyone has that, I'm sure that they could sell it for a lot of money. Um, disease, we can't control that oftentimes. Nutrition, we can. Genetics, um, what we introduce in. Pasture management. Um, I won't have a lot of time to talk about pasture management, but that is something that is important um, with parasite management as well. So there are some things that are out of our control and some things that are within our control. This is the number one problem with small ruminants. So I have most of my foundational experiences in um, domestic livestock species, which extrapolates really well to the exotic sector. Um, it, sheep and goat are our number one problem. Um, if you have sheep and goat, you're probably shaking your head right now saying, yes, it's not just you, it's everybody. Um, it's not a secret. Um, everyone who has sheep and goat struggles with intestinal parasites, so you're not alone. 
There are exotic bovids that appear to be more susceptible, um, specifically giraffe and sable, and we'll get into why that is um, in just a minute. There are no new drugs on the market. It's been 27 years since we've had a um, new deworming drug on the market in the United States. Um, so we need to be really careful about how we're using our products because we're not gonna get new products anytime soon. There's no pull from the FDA or USDA or any um, major entity to create new deworming products. For us, we're like, yes, we totally need these things in the exotic sector in sheep and goats, that doesn't, that's not the money maker for them. So they're not gonna drive this. It's vaccines um, and other programs. So we're not gonna get new drugs. Um, resistance is increasing. I'll talk about that next. Um, but this is a really big fear um, and something that not a lot of people understand. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, so you guys can have a better foundation as to why resistance is increasing. We need a more integrative approach. So we need to look at the domestic model. Um, this is the sheep and the cattle world. We need to look at what they're doing and we need to move to those models because they're doing a really good job of moving off of just doing chemical deworming and kind of getting more integrative as far as how they're managing um, as a more hands-off approach. So this is something that the exotic sector needs to be looking towards and this is something that I've been um, monitoring really closely to get ideas for how do we can help our animals. Resistance, so it is not a myth. <laughs> um, it is, this is the science. So these are documented evidence. These are um, journal articles, some as soon as 2017. There's also ones in 2021 um, that have been documenting resistance as a real um, threat in all domestic species, but um, exotic hoofstock as well. Um, these are all just, I mean, this is fact, this is science, you can't dispute this. These are, these are real researchers who are out there looking at these parasites and they're showing that there is widespread resistance. This is not just in domestic species. We're seeing a lot of resistance to, anti, um, to parasite drugs in giraffe. And we've also seen it in other species as well, but specifically we're seeing a lot of this in giraffes. So this is a very, um, it's a super exotic, it's worth a lot of money. This is an asset that we have a hard time protecting if we can't deworm them appropriately. What is resistance? This is a really small slide for a really big idea. Um, worms all are made with a diverse genome. So just like all of our genetic makeup is different, the genetic makeup of a worm is, is already inherent. It is what it is inside of its genetic makeup. They're not developing this super resistance where they're like, oh, if I develop this mutation, I'll be able to survive. They already have it. So. There is mutation rates that are there, but they're not being selective. They're just already there. Um, so what happens is some of these worms have a mutation that allows them to survive a deworming. So when we deworm, those worms survive. Those are resistant worms because they had some inherent DNA that allowed them to survive the deworming process. And now they will not be susceptible to that dewormer because of their genetic mutation. What are the most common causes of resistance? Frequent deworming, quarterly deworming in your food. So this is frequent deworming. Um, treating all of your animals, deworming in your food. Um, so treating everything on your property, it makes you feel better, but it's not, gonna, it's not doing you any good if you have a problem later. Um, you're probably creating a resistance. Underdosing. If you don't know the weight of an animal, just Google it and kind of extrapolate from there. That's what we do. I would rather you overdose on most of these drugs than underdose. We'll get to the drugs later. There's a couple that you don't want to do that on, but underdosing is a really common reason because um, the worms are not getting exposed to a high enough level of the drug for it to be considered therapeutic or to actually kill the population. So how do we prevent resistance? So the most obvious is not doing the three things listed on the slide. Um, but the second is um, to increase refugia. So refugia is based on the word refuge. These are the, t the parasites, the larvae, the animals that are under refuge from the drug. This is the most important concept that you can leave here today with, is that refugia, you have to have this on your property or you will not have a population of animals that will survive um, for generations to come. These are the animals that have not been under selective treatment with your dewormer. So these are the animals you chose not to deworm. The larvae on the pasture have never been exposed to deworming process. Um, that's what we're talking about with refugia. This is the most important component of drug resistant selection um, in domestic species and exotic species as well. 
I'm all about examples and being visual, so I'm going to give you an example of how um, resistance works so you can have a better understanding. So this is a goat. He's a markhor, um, obviously. And so his parent worms are the blue and the red. So our blue worms are the worms that are susceptible. We're gonna just say, for example, this we're talking about fembendazole in particular here. So the blue worms are susceptible to fembendazole and the red worms are not. So we're gonna treat this animal because he has a very high parasite burden. He's very sick and sad. So we're gonna deworm him. So we give him our drug treatment, which is gonna be fembendazole. Those worms die because they're susceptible. So the next generations of worm that this animal is gonna carry are gonna be our resistant population. You can see his number has decreased, so he feels better, he has less worms, uh, but this next generation is gonna be resistant to fembendazole. So we're gonna take him to two different ranches in this scenario. Ranch number one dewormed everything in their pen for several years at three month intervals with fembendazole without using any selective treatment. So they just said, I feel better when I feed fembendazole. Everyone told me to do this. I'm going to do it. They have resistance to fembendazole. The next generation, so this is our guy over here that we dewormed, and these are all the animals in the pasture that we dewormed for three years with fembendazole that are now resistant. So we're going to put him in this pen, and we're going to continue to treat with fembendazole. Their numbers are low right now, but as we continue to give them dewormer and the dewormer's not working, they're going to get higher, and they're not going to respond to your treatment. So this is an example of an animal that's, this is gonna be a resistance problem on this group and you may need to switch to a different drug um, or you may have more resistance than you think um, to other drug populations. Ranch number two consults with Dr. East and <laughs> dewormed the animals in their pen that needed it. So they did fecal egg counts, which we'll get to later, um, and they, they uh, dewormed based on degree of anemia. So this is like John Bailey, who listens to all of my parasite preaching, um, and he does this with his Markor pen. So we put this animal in this pen. Now we have one friend here that's, that's also resistant, but we have all these blue worms. These are all animals that have not been exposed to dewormer. These animals are your refuge, they're your refugia. And when this animal goes out and sheds his worms into your pasture, they're going to breed with these blue worms and you're gonna dilute out your resistant genes. So this is the point that I'm trying to make about resistance is that when you leave animals in refugia, you are creating a better opportunity for your animals to not have resistance and your drugs are gonna do more for you in the long run. Um, so this is a really important concept. I think the visual helps a lot with explaining it. Um, hopefully it does. If it doesn't, come see me after and we'll get to it. Um, so getting to know the enemy. Um, so who are we battling up against? Um, there's lots and lots of them. Um, they live in different places. Based on where they live is where they like to, to establish their clinical disease process. So based on what location they're at will determine their clinical signs that you see in your animals. The abomasum, the stomach is four chambered and ruminants. Your um, abomasum is your true stomach. So it's the most glandular part. So it's, it's, the, it's the one that does the most absorption. Um, that is where some of our intestinal parasites like to live, the small intestine, and then the large intestine. So these are the three main places that we see um, intestinal parasites. This is important for like necropsy purposes as well. If you see worms in a certain area, you might have an idea of what you have based on that. This is an overwhelming slide, not a take home note. This is just to show you that there are a lot of different worms and they live in a lot of different places. Um, and there are different species based on it being a goat or sheep, which is what I'm classifying as a small ruminant. Um, and then the, the bovids. So this is our, um, you know, most of our antelope species are bovidae. So their parasites are gonna be different than our sheep and our goats. Um, and then they all have fun, really long names and then they have what people call them. So I put those in red. This is also a take home slide. So this is something that all of you need to know when you leave this room, what homonchus is. Homonchus is the barber pole worm. It is our number one problem. Um, this is the parasite that affects sable and giraffe. So this is why this is an important slide. And it's also the number one parasite of sheep and goats. It's called the barber pole worm because it's beautifully striped like a barber pole. Um, and so now it has that name. It's a blood sucking worm. So it attaches on the stomach wall and it sucks blood from the stomach wall. Um, so we'll talk more about what that looks like. Um, 
This, this worm preys on the weak, young, pregnant, and lactating. So your most susceptible populations, when they're in their biggest energy imbalance, is when this parasite is gonna come and attack them. Your young, especially when they're weaning, they're stressed out. This is when this parasite likes to hit. Your, your pregnant animals, they're about to give birth, and they're going through a negative energy balance or a stressful period, um, and this is when this parasite proliferates. Um, same for lactation. They're very prolific. If we could breed homonchus as an egg super exotic, we would be really rich because one female can produce 5,000 eggs a day. Um, so they're quite prolific in their reproduction. Um, so this is a parasite we have a hard time battling, as you can tell, um, with how prolific they are and how resistant it's become to many of the classes of dewormers. It has a very short life cycle, and it lives on your pasture for a very long time. Um, so this is public enemy number one for small ruminant farmers and also for our sheep and goat populations, our sable and our giraffe. Um, I don't know why sable and giraffe appear to be the most susceptible to homonchus. We certainly know that other species are exposed to them, um, but they appear to be the ones that are the most severely affected. This is what homonchus looks like. And just for a gauge of how much blood a worm can suck is that a thousand adults can do 50 mils of blood loss per day. So your animals are not dying of diarrhea, they're not dying of weight loss, they're dying of anemia. And that happens before you even notice anything's wrong with them. So they don't have to be skinny, they don't have to look bad, they don't have to look ill thrift, they just can die. Um, so this is an important concept, is that we always expect that they're gonna look a certain way when they have parasites, but that's not always the case, especially with homonchus. This is an amazing photo that a client sent me that is a sable necropsy. And they, they had just seen my talk about homonchus and they saw this on the necropsy and they sent it to me and we were able to identify the cause of death, which was awesome because at that point he didn't know that this is what it looked like. So on the right side is what he saw on the necropsy and then on the left is what he picked up and I, I actually saved the worms and I put them in a jar and I was gonna bring them today, but I forgot. <laughs> so um, they're very small, so they don't always look like this big mat. Um, but when you rinse them off, you can actually see the barber pole striping on them, which I'll show you in another slide. But this was a, if you can't identify the apomasum on a necropsy, let me know and I will tell you how to find it. Um, but there are certain things inside of the different stomachs that you can use to identify where you're at. And that can help you because the homonchus worm lives in the abomasum. So if you find this in the abomasum, you've found a pretty certain cause of death if you see this many. This is a really cool photo that another vet sent me. You can actually see the barber pole striping on them. Um, so she got some really good photographs of the worm. So we were, she was able to identify homonchus as the cause of death in this animal um, based on the necropsy findings. This slide is, um, we sent some samples off on some sable that we had. Um, we, we went ahead and treated the group and the herd before we knew what we were dealing with, but we had a suspicion that it was homonchus. We, there is a test that you can send out. It takes 21 days, so you still have to fix the problem before because by 21 days, everything would be dead. Um, but you can grow these out in a lab. It takes 21 days, and you can find out exactly what type of worms you have, which is really helpful to know what you're up against. So we were able to hatch these out and identify that homonchus was our problem, which helped us in terms of how we are gonna approach this strategy of deworming in the future. Um, we were able, we, after we did the deworming of the herd and we moved everybody, we did not lose a single animal after that. Um, the biggest thing is anemia, so checking the mucous membranes. Another take home message, do not look at the gums or the mouth um, for your mucous membranes. It is always pale or it's pigmented or it doesn't, they always look terrible. So stop looking in their mouths, <laughs> look at their eyes. So you wanna pull down right at the medial canthus of their eye and pull that down and you're gonna look at their mucous membrane color there. Don't look in their mouth, it doesn't help. Um, so these are animals that are anemic. This animal, they don't have it pulled down, but that's a sable on the top right. Um, and that's us pulling down the mucous membrane to show that the color is extremely white. Um, this is a mark core that got a blood transfusion in the middle. Um, and then the right is bottle jaw. So this is something that you might all have heard of before. This is when an animal loses a lot of protein, they start to accumulate fluid, and that's what the bottle jaw is. Um, it can be evidence of homonchus, but other um, intestinal parasites can do it as well. But I see it the most common in homonchus. So 
If you tell me your animal has an abscess on its jaw, but it went away, and then I'm like, send me a picture, and you send me this picture, I'll be like, that's not an abscess. We have a serious problem. Um, so it's not an abscess, especially if it goes away and comes back like that. It's bottle jaw. Tricurus, this is a whipworm. This lives in the large intestine, so it causes diarrhea as the main clinical sign. It's found in a lot of species of exotics. This is just a, a, a published study that just came out um, in giraffe. Um, so this is, an, and other hoof stock in this study also had tricurus or whipworms. Um, tricurus can cause diarrhea. So this is a clinical sign that we see with, with whipworms. Um, they can cause severe anemia in really, really bad cases. I've never seen it cause anemia, but it can. Um, I put a picture of a, a camel on here because camels are extremely susceptible to trichuris and um, a small population of trichuris can kill a camel. Um, I add damas on here. I'm learning every day and I'm not no expert. We've recently seen um, severe whipworm infections in damas, which has never been something I've been aware of. So just to say that we, we just don't know in exotics um, what animals are more susceptible to what disease processes, but we have seen um, now high strongile counts um, and whipworms in damas be a cause of death. Coccidia, I'm glad I didn't have to speak after lunch with my diarrhea slides, but um, coccidia is also one that affects the young. This is one that I think everyone thinks their animal has, but it, they normally, it's not a problem. If you get a fecal red and it says your adult animal has coccidia, it's not really a big deal because adults can have a normal coccidia burden and not be sick. It almost only affects your young weanling animals. Um, so if you have sheep and goats, write this down. If they have diarrhea, they probably have coccidia. Um, that's one that I will hang my hat on because if they're young and they're a sheep and a goat and they have diarrhea, they probably have coccidia. Um, main clinical sign, severe watery pipose diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, disgusting diarrhea, it's horrible. Um, so they can die from severe dehydration from this, and the onset of clinical signs is very acute. Um, the last one is a video, we'll see if it plays. Um, they can be, become neurologic. So this is a goat that has severe coccidia infection, and he has involuntary eye mo well, movement in general, but involuntary eye movement right there. So that's called nystagmus. His head is stable, but his eyes are moving. That's a neurologic sign. They can get these for other reasons too, but an important note of coccidia is they can become neurologic from this. And when they reach this stage, it is very difficult to treat them, um, but we have had some cases where we've been able to get them back from this. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the meningeal worm, which was my favorite worm in school because it's the longest name ever. It's Paralosophilus strongulus tenuous. But meningeal worm for your purposes. And it is a parasite of white-tailed deer. The important thing to know is that it doesn't affect white-tailed deer. They just harbor it, they carry it, it's their friend, doesn't kill them, doesn't do anything to them. There's also has to be a snail in this scenario for, um, for this life cycle to occur, um, but a white-tailed deer is part of the, of the transmission. Exotics are extremely susceptible, almost to the point where I would say I wouldn't even house white-tailed deer with your super exotics ever if there's a water source with snails because this disease process is very, very um, common if you have those syndromes together with white-tailed deer, water, snails, um, and exotics. How this parasite works is it hatches in the stomach, then it migrates to the spinal cord, it tracks through the spinal cord and makes holes in it, and they become clinical from that. So it causes lameness, gait abnormalities, weakness in the back end, paralysis, and death. It looks a lot like trauma, and it looks a lot like they were fighting with another animal and maybe they just got injured. Um, so this is a really hard one to diagnose, and we only recently in the last two or three years started sending off spinal cord segments on animals that were neurologic to just make sure, and sure enough, we were finding this. This is a case, so this is a giraffe that we saw um, that originally presented for lameness. And in the first videos, which are not here, it just looked like it was limping. And so we assumed that it had had an injury of some sort. Um, so we treated it with meloxicam and it didn't improve. And then the lameness progressed and it got much different. So in these videos, you're gonna see when this animal starts to walk, that he has no idea where his feet are. So he's dragging his toes and he's kind of just like walking like a drunk guy on, you know, on North Gate. He doesn't know where his feet are in space. Um, he's stumbling. He, 
and he just is his gait is very abnormal. So this progressed from just a lameness to a severe neurologic disease. Um, and then the last one you can see, he actually touches his feet together. Um, he hits his hooves together and he walks really wide and he takes these huge front steps. So this became a neurologic process um, and it actually progressed to, so we treated this animal with ivermectin and dexamethasone, like super high doses, um, and we were able to get him better from the first couple of presentations. However, once the damage in the spinal tract is done, it's really hard to, you can't regrow spinal cord tissue. So um, he did well for a couple of months, and then unfortunately his disease progressed, and in the last video, he can be seen, he just keeps get, trying to get up and fall over. Um, so he eventually did, uh, he was euthanized for this. So this is something that can affect exotics. The weird thing about this syndrome is, is that when you walk up to these animals, they're paralyzed, but they're normal in their face. Like they, they're snorting at you, they're acting like they wanna hurt you, but they physically are not able to get up most of the time. And if they do, they just kind of fall over. It can look like other disease processes. So just because you see this doesn't mean it's meningeal worm. I only put this on here to keep it in the back of your mind um, that this is still a possibility. Clinical signs of parasitism in exotics. A lot of times we'll get people saying, they must have diarrhea, they have to have a poor body condition, and that's not the case. Um, I'm gonna show you some pictures of that as a clinical syndrome, but I would just caution you that that's not always the case, which makes it really hard to determine if your animals have parasites or not, if, it, if it's not that straightforward. So goats and sh sheep and goats and sable, um, obviously giraffe, you're not gonna be able to look in their eyelid unless they're very friendly. Um, you're gonna wanna look at the mucous membranes. This is the Famacha. It's a card that you can get by taking an online certification and it comes with this card. You can hold this card against the mucous membranes of the eye and it will tell you um, whether or not you need to deworm them based on their degree of anemia. Um, so here's that sable again on the left, a bigger picture. This animal was obviously incredibly anemic. Um, the one on the right is just a goat. Um, and so they're holding that card up to see um, whether or not it needs to be dewormed. Oh, and I would say don't do this on the trailer or in the dark or with a flashlight because you're always gonna think they're anemic. So make sure you're using like proper lighting if you can under what circumstances you have. But if you're shining a flashlight on a mucous membrane, you're gonna say it's pale every time. Bottle jaw, these giraffes have homonchus. Um, this is a clinical syndrome that we see specifically in giraffe with, with homonchus. They have to have a pretty high parasite burden to have the bottle jaw, so when you see this, this is like danger 100 times over. When you see this, it's time to do something really serious um, because by the time you have this, you're in really bad shape. Um, we have been able to get some animals back from bottle jaws in giraffes, um, but we've also lost quite a few with bottle jaw as well. Body condition, this is a really telltale one in juvenile giraffe, um, but you can actually tell in a juvenile giraffe that has a possible parasite problem based on their body condition score. So I will say that does appear to be an animal that um, you can tell from a body condition score whether, whether or not they're gonna have a parasite burden. Um, another bottle jaw, we see a lot of bottle jaw. Um, another poor body condition score, these animals had severe um, homonchus infestations. Um, the bongo on the left had severe whipworms and pneumonia. Um, he survived that somehow, um, but you can see that his body condition is really poor, and maybe that's what set this animal up to be a, a prime suspect for parasites. Um, the one on the right is a sable. Um, she had severe parasites and developed a secondary bloat, and she continued to re she remained bloated for um, several years like this um, before she eventually succumbed to that. Um, this is an animal that was geriatric. Um, she was like a typhoid Mary, so no matter what we did, she always had parasites. So we decided to euthanize her because it wasn't worth the risk of the rest of the herd. And this is to show that geriatric animals are also ones that you can kind of tell from body condition scores, um, whether or not they have parasites. Sometimes they just look bad because they have other disease processes. But this animal had a really severe strong jaw count and she was in horrible body shape and she was a really old grandma. Um, so she was definitely um, one that wasn't responding to any of the treatments. I don't talk a lot about equids in here, but they can have ascarids, which are these like crazy worms that you see. They can get impactions from this and torsions just like regular colic and horses. Um, so this is just don't write off that zebras are really hardy and nothing kills them because 
this will definitely kill them. So you should also be looking at fecals on your zebras um, or other equids. Sometimes the only information you get from clinical signs is death, and so you need to use a necropsy. The one on the left is a, is a, uh, a lung from a Marcor. It's PCV or its blood count was six. Um, that's a really pale lung. You can't appreciate it as much on the slide, um, but it was almost white. Um, and then one on the right, sometimes there's just a worm hanging out in there, and that's kind of helpful for your diagnosis. How do you know what types of worms your animals have? So this is the next question that we get from producers. There are two different types of um, analysis that you can do for fecals. You can do a qualitative or a quantitative. A qualitative is the hill that I will die on because it is, you don't know what you're looking at. It's, you literally, they're putting poop in a cylinder, they're floating it and they're putting a slide on it and they're reading it out. So if I put that slide in front of 10 veterinarians and I ask them all to read it, they would all get different answers. And I know this because we've done, the, we've done it. Um, so it's basically someone else's subjective opinion of what the number is on the slide. So these are the results that you might get from your local vet that are one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, really bad, mild, moderate, severe. Um, there's no number, it's a subjective analysis. So it's just one person's opinion about what they're looking at. And who knows how much poop they're putting in there to float it. So it really doesn't give you the best answer if you're just looking for like a proactive approach to deworming your animals. The quantitative analysis, so this is called a McMaster's counting chamber. This is the way that we do them because I want to have a number. I want to know what I'm looking at. Um, so we do them by a quantitative approach. You take a gram of feces, you put it in the fecasol, you mix it up, you put it in the McMaster slide, and that's how you do it forever and ever, amen. There's no room for anyone to do it any differently. So if you give a poop sample to five different veterinarians, you should get pretty close with the McMasters from all of them if they're doing it the same way. So as you can see, the quantitative is the better approach. Not to say that the qualitative doesn't have a place, but it also depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're just trying to get a quick diagnosis and not actually get a baseline number, then that's a fine way to go but a quantitative or a number is gonna be a better approach if you're just trying to see what your population has as a baseline. So there are several different types of parasites you can see on one of these floats. And there are strongyles, coccidia, whipworms, tapeworms, and so all things that we've talked about. Um, an important note for this slide is that there are companies out there that say that they can tell you the difference between the strongyles because there are several different species, homonchus being one of them. You cannot tell the difference between a strongyle on a fecal. Ray Kaplan, the parasite god can't. Dr. Craig at a and can't. You can't, we can't, nobody can. So anyone who can tell you that they can tell the difference between a strongyle is not, is, is not being truthful with you. That's why it's hard to know if you have homonchus because all the strongyles look the exact same. Um, coccidia, so that's one you can see on a fecal. Whipworms are intermittent shedders. So if you see one or two on a fecal, you don't know how bad your burden is because they're not, they are shed very intermittently. So you just don't know what that means. Tapeworms are gross, but they do nothing for the animal. So don't worry about them if you see them. <laughs> and Pierre Davids have a lot of tapeworms. So this is easy to see because I picked the best pictures ever to show you. So you're all probably like, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna run some fecals and I'm gonna figure out what my animals have. And that, that's not how it looks on the real fecal, so it looks more like this. <laughs> and then you're like, what is this thing on the right? And what are all these other crazy things happening on here? There are so many things that you look at on a fecal that look like parasites, like crazy pollen and other stuff that it, without having a trained eye or knowing what you're looking for, it's really hard to know what you're trying to find. And so we're trying to do our best to figure out some resources to connect you guys with because we want you to be able to do this at home, but also know that there are some limitations as far as not having the training to be able to tell. My husband's been reading fecals now for two years and he still sends me pictures and is like, what is this? And I'm like, mm, pollen. So some things still look like parasites that aren't. So um, just because the pictures are pretty on here doesn't mean in real life that it's that clear. These are fecals you don't want to have in your animals. Um, so these are just to show, these are quantitative. So I just floated these because these animals came in really sick and I was like, mm, is this parasites or something else? So I quickly just floated them and the answer was, it's parasites. 
Um, so these are fecals you don't want to see in your animals because both of the, all, these animals with this amount, they, that's not survivable. So that's way too many parasites to be, um, to, to be alive. These are McMasters, so when we were first figuring out our methods for doing McMasters and making sure that they were correct, we were sending them out to outside labs to confirm. And these are some giraffe fecals that we sent out, and this is just to show that there are extremely high numbers. Um, so 6,200 in a giraffe. A baseline of when you treat in giraffe is around 250 to 500. So if you have 6,200, you definitely need a treatment. Um, so this is just to show that not every animal in a group has a high burden. So this is 150, 450, 550, and 1100. Not every animal in that group needs to be treated. So that's just a good example of um, not every animal has parasites, but sometimes one or two does. There are several different identifications um, outside of just the fecals. So the Kaplan lab, this is Ray Kaplan. He's like the father of parasitology. Um, he has a corpiculture lab. So this is a lab that hatches your poop out, and weird things that scientists do, and they can identify the types of worms that you have. A&M also has a lab that does this. Just recently, they got a really awesome new young parasitologist, and he's really excited to work with the exotics sector, and he um, loves when I send him weird samples. So he's been the one that's helping us hatch things out and identify them. There is another step that you can take past that, where you can hatch the samples out, then you can test your worms against different dewormers, and it will tell you what resistance you have. So it goes even further than that, and they say it's an expensive test. It's like $600 to $1,000 depending. That's not that expensive if you think about the cost of losing one bongo or one giraffe. Um, so this is something that you should consider, and if it's something you're interested in doing, let me know, because there are a lot of logistical steps that it takes to get those samples to the lab um, and a time frame for them to grow it out and actually um, test it for resistance. This is not a process that happens overnight, so it does take a while to get this information. There's a new lab um, in Georgia that's doing a lectin staining test. I personally haven't sent anything out there yet for this, but apparently they can take poop and look at the strongyles, and they can use this lectin stain to actually identify um, if, you have strong, if you have homonchus. It's not gonna tell you what it's susceptible to or anything, but it's a quicker way um, than growing out for 21 days to find out if homonchus is your problem. So the next part of this is, so now I've told you all the like horrible things that can happen. And now I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna get rid of them or if we need to kill worms or if we have a problem, what are we gonna do? There are three drug families. Um, you're all gonna shake your heads in familiarity with a lot of these. Um, there are three different families. The difference between the families is how they kill. Um, so it's their weapon of choice is different and the way that they kill is different. So. That's how I want you to think about the three families of drugs. The first one is, is the benzimidol, so this is your white dewormers, um, so your Panicure, Safeguard, Valbazin. Um, these are the most common ones that, that we know of. These are kind of one of our foundational deworming tools. Valbazin is um, toxic to fetus uh, in the first trimester, so important thing to note if you're going to use valbazin, if your animals are recently bred or open, um, it can cause abortions in the first trimester. They do absorb the fetus, so you're not going to see the abortion, but if you have animals that are in the first trimester, maybe just stay away from valbazin unless you're willing to take the risk, so just an important note for that one. The second one is your nicotinics. Um, so this is your levamisole and your morantol. Um, Prohibit is the name for levamisole. This drug is extremely dangerous because it has a very narrow margin of safety. So when you're treating an animal with levamisole, you need to be pretty dang sure what that weight is on the animal because if you overdose it, that animal can die. So this is one that I would caution you not to use unless you're pretty comfortable guessing weights on your animals or unless you have a last resort need to use levamisol. This is something that I don't touch unless I absolutely need to, so I would caution you against just picking up some levamisol and giving it to your animals. I have also heard some crazy stories about people putting levamisol in their water and I would caution you not to do that because we've heard stories of people losing whole populations and herds of animals doing this. Um, because if it has a narrow safety margin, why would you put it in your water and give it to your super exotics? Um, it feels like a really good way to lose a lot of money. So would not recommend doing that. The third one um, is your macrolytic 
lactones, so your avermectins, um, and then your melbomycins, which is all of us in this room know cydectin. And we also have ivermectin, dectamax, epronex. Important thing to note, these all work, again, by the same mechanism. They work the same way. Their affinity for the fat and the lipid and the tissues is different. So that's what makes them different. So if you're using cydectin, I would ask you, why are you not using ivermectin or one of these other drugs that, that might still be beneficial to you? Um, and the affinity is just a little different. So those are the three um, families of dewormers. And then this is the part where I tell you that I lied to you and that there is a new drug on the market, but it's not available in the US and it may never be here. They say it's never gonna be here, um, but it has a new unique mode of action. It's only available in New Zealand and Australia. My husband's Australian, so maybe we can smuggle some in. But <laughs> it's the first new class of dewormer in 25 years. And um, right now, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that it will ever be available in the United States. Because again, it has to be labeled for use here. So it has to, be, it has to go under FDA. Um, they have to do testing on it, get it approved for use in the United States. And that's a very lengthy process, a very expensive process, and something that the market, we see it as a value to us, but the, the market, the domestic species, they, they don't see this as an incentive to, to bring this product over to the United States. Um, so coccidia, so again, this is the one that causes diarrhea in your young sheep and goats. So this is the treatments, panazoril, tiltrazoril, diclazoril. I don't know, they just got really fancy with their names and just kind of changed one letter. Um, the two in yellow are not available in the United States either, mostly in the UK, so you can't use these. Um, and then you have your Albon and Corid. I put this study at the bottom right. Um, my friend Dr. Love did this study at a and and they found that using one dose of panazoril is just as effective as using five days of Corid. So if I was you, I would say, mm, I should probably just treat this animal with a one-time dose of panazoril versus trying to treat it for five days in a row in the water with Corid, not knowing if this animal is even getting what it needs from the water. It does have to be given by mouth, so in our situations when we have animals that have high coccidia levels, we've been recommending that you dart that animal, knock it down, put the panazoril paste in its mouth, and wake it up. It's a really simple and easy, effective treatment, and you don't have to bank on the fact that this animal is drinking from the water, which it may not be. Um, Corid can cause thiamine deficiency, um, so just be aware that if you're giving cord and you start to see weird neurologic signs in your animals, you should probably hit them with some thiamine. Um, nothing neurologic dies without thiamine, so that's, there's your word of advice from a vet. Um, Panazoril is available as marquee. However, we can get it compounded at a pharmacy in a much higher concentration where you don't have to give as much. So if you need um, coccidia medication and you're looking at panazoril, just let us know and we can help connect you to some resources. There's also a preventative for coccidia. Um, most of us know that. If you look at the back of the cord, it's like there's a five-day treatment protocol and a 21-day preventative. Um, there's also all the different things you can put in your food. The list, the end, there's so many things that you can put in your food for coccidia. The important thing on this to note is that, one, these are not killing coccidia, the, the additives to the food. They're coccidia static. That means that they're, they're stopping the reproduction or hindering it, but they're not killing the coccidia. So you're not getting rid of it completely. You're delaying its, its ability to reproduce and grow. Um, and it needs to be fed 21 days in advance of stress. If you see coccidia in your population and you're like, oh crap, I need to do a 21 day treatment, you probably should have been doing that 21 days before the stressor, which we know in animals is pregnancy, so right before they're about to have babies, right before they're about to wean those babies. This is when you put that in your food. So work smarter, not harder. Um, if you know that your animals are about to go under some stressful event, that's when you need to be putting this in your food, not at random times of the year that don't seem to be helpful for you. So the most fascinating part of my lecture for me is the non-chemical dewormers because as a scientist and as a veterinarian, I want to know what are we doing to move the bar forward to change what we're doing now for the future of medicine and for the animals. So that brings me to our next topic, which is non-chemical dewormers. So we went over all the ones, the three families and all that. So this is kind of the fun stuff to me. These are the four that I'm going to talk about. There are a lot of other ones, but these are the four most important and the ones that we get asked about the most. So there's diatomaceous earth, tannins, which are found in plants, um, copper oxide, and then I'm not even going to try to say the word, but it's a fungus. 
diatomaceous earth, so you know the guy at the coffee shop, Joe Blow, whatever his name was, he's also telling you about diatomaceous earth, how he fed it to all his animals and it was so great, and they never had parasites. Not true. So there's no data out there to suggest that diatomaceous earth does anything for your parasite problems. Um, I'm guessing the theory is that it dries the pellets out and maybe they don't hatch as much. But there is no documented evidence and no studies to suggest that this is something that you should be doing. Does it hurt? No. But does it help? No. So I would not recommend doing this. If you're doing it now and you're not seeing a problem, you probably didn't have a problem to begin with. Um, tannins. So these are found in plants. Um, there are certain plants that are higher in tannins than others. And so they found in South Africa that animals were eating on um, tannin-rich plants. They had less they had a reduction in their fecal egg counts, specifically in homonchus. So this is a benefit to us, so we are interested in this. Um, so these are the, the certain plants, chicory, bird's fruit, and there's this other one that I can't pronounce. Those are the three most common ones that they use in the studies. And they did find that it actually reduced the homonchus burden, which is really cool um, and possibly of use to us. The only problem with tannins is that too much tannins can kill you. So the use for us right now in the exotics industry is limited. We need to allow the domestic species, the sheep and the goat producers, to kind of get this under control and give us some better data and information before we start using it in our super exotics. But this is something that I think we should consider in the future um, for exotic hoof stock, especially sheep and goats, because they're browsers and, and this is what tannins, there are certain plants that are higher in tannins that the browsers prefer to eat on. So we do need more studies to know the application. This is a picture of a healthy worm on the left, and on the right, this is a worm that um, from an animal that was fed high tannins. The buccal part of it has been affected and it can't eat, and then it dies, which is great, and then it also can't reproduce. And this is just a study that was in 2014 um, of giving this pelleted version of it to, um, for coccidia and nematodes and weaned goats. This study found that it did work. So super exciting um, research that's being done. We'd love to see the application of this in the exotics industry, especially for weanling goats and sheep. Um, this is something that we could look forward to in the future um, for using for parasites. Copper oxide wire particles, this is my absolute favorite topic in the whole world, so if you want to talk to me about this afterwards, I'd love to. Um, it decreases intestinal parasites, but specifically, again, homonchus, which we know is public enemy number one. Um, so this has actually been used a lot in domestic species, and we've actually been using it a lot in exotics as well. Um, and it does appear to have a place in the exotics industry, so this is something that we have been recommending and using with great success especially in giraffe, and we've actually been doing it in sable as well, um, in other species too, um, with the caution that sheep are sensitive to copper, and it's unknown if other exotics may be sensitive, so copper is still potentially toxic, so you have to use this cautiously, um, and there are certain doses that you should be using, um, which we can talk about if you want afterwards. Um, the other thing is that sheep are sensitive, but we have been doing some studies with myself and another vet where we've been giving sheep copper at really low doses and checking their fecal egg counts. And we have been reducing the homonchus load and we haven't been killing the sheep. So it's, <laughs> it's been a win so far, um, but there may be an application for this in sheep eventually um, with lower, much lower doses of copper. This is the presumed mechanism of action. They're not still 100%, but when they took cross-sections of the worms after being fed um, the copper oxide wire particles, you can see that there are some damages to the membrane of the parasite, um, so that appears to be the mechanism. It is not a dewormer, so I will add that you can't just give them copper if they have parasites. You also need to be giving a dewormer. It's like the second hit. So the first hit is your dewormer and the second hit is your copper. Um, so that's how it works, is it works as a combination product. It can be used to reduce numbers by itself, but not in a high population of worms. You would still need to utilize a dewormer. Um, these are some awesome studies. I I uh, absolutely love the two vets at Fossil Rim. They're super great and they have a really good knowledgeable base about parasites and they have a good base about the private industry in the sector here in Texas. Um, so we do a lot of collaboration with them and they're actually utilizing these products and using it. So we've been talking a lot to them about what they've been seeing in their animals. Have they been seeing copper um, issues? They haven't um, in treating. So we kind of use them as a base and they're starting this um, trend towards using copper oxide wire particles in the private sector.
This is a pellet that's made in Australia um, that's available. It's really hard to get, you have to import it, um, and it can be fairly expensive to get over here with all the quarantine procedures. So this is just to mention that there are foods out there. I do believe there are some other companies that are starting to make a copper oxide wire particle food. Um, there's been new evidence to suggest, as Brian says, that some of our copper, some of our exotic species are more copper deficient. So feeding them copper in the food doesn't appear to be an issue at this point because we there is copper deficiency because of our environments in Texas and our soil and our water. The last one is the fungus. So I'm not gonna try to say the name. I don't know why they didn't just name it Bioworma. Um, but that's the trade name is Bioworma or Livamol. This is a trapping fungus. So again, not a dewormer. This is not gonna kill parasites inside of your animals, but it's gonna decrease the shedding in your environment. So if you're treating a population for a high worm burden, and they're pooping it out into your pasture, they're gonna reinfect themselves unless you do something for pasture control. So this is something that you can top dress on the food and it will actually trap the fungus, or the, the fungus will trap the nematodes and prevent them from getting out into the environment. There are two different products, Bioworma and the Livamol. The Livamol is terrible, the palatability sucks, the animals hate it, and you have to feed a lot more of it. So sorry if anyone from Bioworma was here, but <laughs> the other product, the regular Bioworma is a much better product. So the Livamol one is, the palatability is not good. Um, so just some more studies to show that this does works because science is important, but it's even more important when it's backed up with literature. And then this is a picture of what the fungus is doing. So on the left is a normal parasite hatching out of the feces. The one on the right is being trapped um, so it can't get away. And then it's not getting to shed into the environment. So. The next part is just some management strategies. So these are like little tidbits that I wanted to leave with um, that I felt were important, um, but don't necessarily fit into the scope of my talk. So I just wanted to quickly go over some of those. Um, the first one is gonna be an inconvenient truth. So I'm sorry for anyone whose feelings I hurt, but stop feeding fembendazole on your food. <laughs> um, not totally, but don't do it in quarterly intervals or don't do it without knowing what you're doing because you're just creating a problem for yourself and, and maybe you just didn't know. So education is important. Um, so this talk was meant to tell you why you shouldn't. It's, if I just say don't do it, you're gonna ask me why. And so this PowerPoint is about why you need to not utilize that um, because when you actually need it, you're not gonna be able to use it. Um, so a perfect example is we just had a whole group of damas that had the Trichuris whipworms, right? Those animals had never been exposed to a dewormer ever thankfully. So we were able to use fenbendazole in the food as our strategy, and we eliminated all of the parasites from those animals with the use of fenbendazole because they'd never been exposed. If this producer had been doing it quarterly in the food, and these animals had already developed some type of resistance to it, we would have never been able to use that. And we all know damas are horrible to dart. We would have been darting all of these damas and treating them with valbazin or the only drugs that work for um, whipworms. So... This is to warn you or caution you that if you wanna use this product, use it in a way that's gonna be helpful for your program and don't shoot yourself in the foot early in the game by exposing all of your animals to it before. And again, this is just to say that resistance is a real thing. So why don't you do fenbendazole? Because it goes back to the first slide. You're frequently deworming, you're treating all of your animals, and you're most likely underdosing. There's no way that you know how much those animals are getting and the ones that you want to get it they're you're weak, you're sick. They're not the ones going up and getting the most food. They're the ones getting run off the food. Um, so thinking about the strategy behind the deworming too, sometimes the best thing is to, to knock down and treat that sick animal by itself and not treat the whole population. Um, so I know that's an inconvenient truth. We all just wanna put it in our food and say that we have no problems. But if you're someone who says that you put dewormer in your food and you don't have a, a parasite problem, my question will be, how do you know? Have you ever tested your poop? Have you ever tested your fecals? How do you know you don't have a problem? So maybe you never had a problem to begin with, but you've created one by deworming quarterly in your food. The 80-20 rule, this has held true for every single ranch we've ever worked on, but one. Um, so I will say there are exceptions to the rule. So 20% of your herd sheds 80% of your parasites. 
you're, there's no reason to treat your whole population because your whole population doesn't have it. That's facts. Like your most susceptible animals are your young, your weak, your pregnant, your lactating. It's not your whole group. So you don't need to treat everybody. You need to treat these typhoid Marys. And sometimes you can identify those animals visually, but other times you can extrapolate it based on where they're at in their stage of life. Is that a juvenile? Is it a yearling? Is it under stress? Is it being pushed out of the herd? Is it a female that just had a baby? Is it an animal that has, is older, geriatric? Sometimes you can figure out who these animals are without having to deworm the whole population. You can just selectively treat the animals that are your, and still leave refugia in your population as well. If you're gonna do fenbenazole on your food because you need to based on fecals, um, then you need to fast for 24 hours because the efficacy of fenbenazole is increased on an empty stomach. Um, so if you deworm them with fenbenazole, fast them the 24 hours before and then treat them again the next day. So a lot of times we'll do like a five to seven day course of dewormer in the food if we're treating an animal population that needs it. Um, it just increases the effectiveness of your dewormer. If you have giraffe, this is a slide I made for the giraffe conference, but giraffes are browsers. How do they get parasites? Because they get bored and they eat grass and that's how they get it, which is just, it, it's a simple fix in the sense that if you just decrease the, them grazing, you're gonna decrease your parasite load. And you can decrease the amount of feces, not by feeding them less, but by picking up their poop. So I wanna make sure you know that. Um, so decrease their grazing, they're bored, they're gonna pick parasites up off the ground. Um, so what we mean by increasing enrichment and browsing is going and cutting down appropriate browse around your property. They're gonna demolish the trees in your pasture like pretty quickly, but they still want more browse. So there are certain browse species that are appropriate for giraffes. If you don't have that list and you have giraffes, let me know, uh, I'd be happy to give it to you. You can have your managers cut this down, even if it's winter and the giraffes, there's no leaves left on it, they'll even just eat some of the bark off of it and it gives them something to do because they're bored. If they're out there like sucking on the fence and licking on the wire and, and doing things that giraffes do, you're like, oh, that's just what giraffes do. It's not, they're bored, they want something to do. Um, increasing their enrichment, which is increasing the way that you're presenting their food. Make it a puzzle for them, make it hard for them. Give them, it takes them 40 minutes to eat if you put it in a way, like in a PVC pipe feeder. And there's all these different things that you can use. Lauren Kimbrough has some amazing enrichment and carry um, as far as how you can feed your giraffes in a way that gives them a little bit um, longer to do it and they will not graze as much. So that is my giraffe spiel for today. Uh, management tips, so another thing that you hear at the feed store is rotate your dewormers. Don't do that. So this is an old wives tale. It's now been disproved um, with multiple theories from parasitologists. So stop rotating because now you're just creating this super bug because you've exposed it to like literally every dewormer and every mechanism of action and now you have nothing to use. So use the same dewormer on your place until you find a reason why you shouldn't. Like if you do, if you deworm with something and it stops working or you have an animal die from parasites, okay, that's time to switch. Or you test every year for resistance on your place and you know what you can use. Um, so it's, don't rotate just to rotate. That's been debunked long ago. Drug combinations, I say this specifically for sheep and goats. When you have new animals coming onto your place or if you're treating animals, these are animals that we're recommending treating with two to three different dewormers depending on how severe your problem is. Um, if you're gonna treat with two different dewormers, use different classes, like they work different ways, so don't use the same class, because you're gonna get, you're not gonna improve anything by using Safeguard and Valbazin, they work the exact same. So you wanna use dewormers from different classes. So you wanna use something like Cydectin oral and Valbazin oral. So you wanna hit those worms with different mechanisms of action, so you have a much more you have a, a more efficacious dose and a more efficacious kill off of your parasites. Um, it's very dangerous though if you're just doing this to do it. You need to know who you're treating and why. So don't just treat everybody with your two or three dewormers because then you're creating super resistance and you probably won't have that species for much longer because you won't have anything to deworm them with. So this is all the places that we went today and then just to leave you with a couple of tips. Um, one, run fecals frequently to identify if you have a problem that exists and what type of intestinal parasites you have. I'm not saying you have to sit and stare at one specific animal all day until it poops, 
But if you know where they eat and graze and you know when you feed them there, they just sit there and poop, then after they leave or while they're there, go out and pick up some fresh samples. We all know what fresh samples look like, so don't do the crusty ones. Like, actually check and make sure they're fresh because um, you can't tell the difference on a fecal if it's fresh or not because they'll hatch out of the eggs and that doesn't help us. Um, but getting a couple of different samples from your populations, I would say like 25% of the population would be great. If you have animals that you're concerned about, your heavy lactators, your young, those are animals you should individually identify and try to get fecals on. You don't have to have them ear tagged. You don't have to individually identify them. It's super helpful if you do, but just having a baseline on your herd, if you give me 10 samples and one animal has a high fecal egg count, we can probably figure out what animal that is. But if they all have a high fecal egg count, then we have a different problem. Um, so I'm not saying you have to sit there and follow every single animal, but at least get some type of baseline at different times of the year, because we know it's affected by rainfall. Um, so you wanna know what your baseline is, so then if you get a problem, you know. If your damas have always had 100 eggs per gram, and that's fine, if suddenly you have five to 600 eggs per gram, we have a problem. Um, so getting a baseline is really important, even if you don't currently have a problem. Do not deworm without a pretreatment fecal egg count. Why? You're, you're wasting your money and you're wasting your time. You don't know if your treatment works, so why are you doing that? And if you want to protect your asset and protect the money that you're putting in these animals by deworming them, know what you're treating and, and if your numbers go down. Um, it doesn't help if you don't know if you have a problem. Um, and then I'll ask you if you're deworming in the food and you don't have a problem, how do you know? <laughs> Um, after treatment, in 14 days, you want to recheck. If you send me a fecal after 14 days and it's high, I'll tell you I don't know if they just picked it back up in the environment. So after 14 days, I should know um, if there's a reduction in their fecal egg count, whether or not your dewormer worked. Um, and deworming, if you take your pre-treatment fecal and your after-treatment fecal, you want a 95% reduction. If you have less than 95% reduction, that's considered a resistance. Only give copper oxide water particles with veterinary advice and recommendations. The dose is not as high as you think it would be, and it depends on the animal species and their weight. And when you're giving this, you're gonna say, oh, I need to give a lot of it because there's a lot of animals and they weigh a lot. It's really not that much of the copper oxide water particles. So if you're gonna use this, don't just go like crazy. There's no dose on the back of this for this purpose. So you're gonna use the cattle dose and you're gonna have some copper problems. Um, if you can clean feces out of enclosures daily, I get that this is not applicable for most of you, but if you have a population in a small area, say giraffe, um, we have a client that picks poop out of his sable pen every single day, and he doesn't have a parasite problem. It did take losing four animals for him to do this, um, but he cleans it out every single day. They clean it out because they don't wanna lose any more sable, and they put them in a smaller pen. If this is something that you can feasibly do with one of your populations, um, then I would recommend doing it, but obviously we're not, we don't have a million employees to go out and, and clean poop all day. Do not underdose on deworming. If you're estimating a weight, just go on the higher end of the estimate unless you're using levamisole. Um, but for everything else, I'd rather you overdose than underdose because at least you're not creating resistance. Don't rotate dewormers, we just talked about that. And then don't treat every single animal. Um, and consult your veterinarian for assistance with proper parasite control. We're here to help, we're not the enemy, we wanna help you protect your asset, and this is gonna be the fight of the next generation, is gonna be parasites. So it's really important that the things that you learn here today that you talk about to other people that aren't in this room because we need to move the bar forward and we can't do that until people understand that the old wives' tales and the things that we've been told in the past are not true, um, and this is the science behind it. So if we wanna protect these animals for the future generations to enjoy, um, um, and for conservation efforts, we have to um, move the bar. We have to do something different, and that's going to be a more integrative approach to our management. Um, so thank you guys for having me and for letting me speak for an hour. Um, and then my husband, Ian, is here too, and we'll be here afterwards if you guys have any questions. Um, so I really appreciate you guys letting me come. Thank you, Brittany. That was excellent. Um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, everyone has... Uh, enjoyed the speakers that we've had up to this point.